I want to talk about winning the battles in your mind. And you've heard me speak of this before, and I'm going to keep speaking on it because Jesus keeps saying that son, son is the battlefield. It's in the mind of individuals. It's your mind that makes the decisions of what you're going to do, what you're not going to do. It's your mind that makes the decision, how am I going to live my life? And this is what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. He said, dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Let's break it down. I urge you as aliens. See, there's a lot of people that have been saying, you know, he's strange. Man, he's like, he, he's like an alien. Well, you are. You're an alien and a strange. That's what you're supposed to be. But yet most Christians love the world so much that if Jesus was to come back, he'd say, oh, Lord, can't you come back tomorrow? I really wanted to do this thing today. We're so ingrained into this world's thinking, this world's economy, this world that we forget that we're supposed to be living in this world as, a, as an alien and a stranger. Jesus has taken us in, and placed us into the kingdom of God by translating us out of the kingdom of darkness into his kingdom. Because this whole world, the Bible says, lies in the power of the evil one. That's what John... Now, do you believe that? I mean, I believe the scriptures. John the Apostle said the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. In other words, the evil influence upon the hearts of those that are not Christians is being energized and motivated by the devil himself, Satan himself. That's why the Bible says that we're supposed to be an alien and a stranger in this world. But then the second part of this, abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. That's the battle. That is the battle. We live in this world, but we're not supposed to be of the world. But yet we work in this world. Uh, some of you work jobs with individuals that curse, they scream and yell. And, um, you know, I had a friend who told me he was a construction worker one time, and he said, it's so difficult in Manhattan to be able to be a Christian because all I ever hear is people cursing. They're whistling at the girls. They're, they're cursed. You know, they, they're always just showing stuff on their phones that's not godly. They make fun of me because I'm a Christian and I bring my Bible to work. They call me holy preacher and holy roller and holy everything. Well, thank God, at least they got you right. Praise God. At least they're calling you the right thing. You know, no, I'm a Christian. That's what I am. And, and I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes. Can you say amen? We are an alien and a stranger. For the Jewish people, God said that you were a peculiar people. And they are peculiar today to the rest of the world. They happen to be God's chosen people, according to the Bible. They're the apple of his eye, according to the Bible. Now, they need the Messiah just like we need the Messiah to be saved. But still, God chose them out from every other nation. And they are peculiar. In fact, you have to say, there's something really peculiar about how this nation could be living surrounded by enemies that people want to hate them all the time. And every war that was ever fought against them, they ended up winning, although they were outnumbered so much. It's the only place in that particular area where you find streams in the desert, where they have wonderful fruit growing, and, and because of the, the, uh, the blessings of God, they're doing fine. And, of course, the enemies around them would like to destroy them and get rid of them. But they can't get rid of Israel. Why? Because Israel is in the prophetic timetable of God. Now, they're not going to get into heaven without Christ. But there are fulfillments to that land that God will never, never take back and rescind. And those borders there are supposed to include much of the territory that doesn't even belong to Israel right now. But just as they are peculiar people, we Christians are supposed to be a peculiar people. There should be something different about us. We should act differently when we're around other individuals, not wearing 300-foot crosses and, you know, and trying to prove that we're Christians that way, but by our love, serving one another. There should be something different about us. But the Bible says, as strangers in this world, we're to abstain. What's the, world abs what's the word abstain mean? Who can tell me? Stay away from Sinful desires. Where are those desires? In you. 
wait a minute, I thought when I got saved, I didn't have any more sinful desires. Okay, but the battle is in the mind. It's always in the mind. I was thinking about it the other day. Half of the things that we fantasize about, we wouldn't even be fantasizing about it if we never gave into it in the beginning. Really. It's kind of like I almost wish that half the fantasies that run through men's minds were never there. It's almost like we could, you know, we can't even fantasize what it's like to give birth to a baby because we're men. You see, we can't, even, we can't even think about it. There's no fantasy about it. We just see women go through that, and we go, oh, my gosh, how do they do that? We can't even handle colds, you see. But every woman that's ever given birth never forgets what that was about unless she was put to sleep. Okay, and the baby came out and just sent her a postcard and boom. But they never forget. And that's imprinted into the mind. And every action that you do is imprinted into the mind. If it's a sinful action, it's imprinted into the mind. It's like a pathway that's made. Then if you keep doing it, that pathway gets stronger and stronger and the brain begins to just develop more and more connections in that area and it's kind of like you just make this pathway clearer and clearer and clearer so that any kind of stimulation in that particular area boom brings up this pathway and that pathway always leads to the chemicals in your brain that make you feel good and you want to do it and that's why you go ahead and do it that's what habits all about it all has to do with the mind and the brain well how do you stop that you abstain from it I like to tell people, you know, going, going on a diet is a lot like trying to stop sin, okay? It's hard to do. Why? Because you want to eat. You want to eat the things that you don't want to eat. I picked the craziest time to go on diets. I started my diet again for health reasons. I want to, I want to but it's the wrong time because I have all these goodies to eat. So after I finish the goodies, I'll start the diet. Praise God. Jess is helping me out, but she doesn't need to go on a diet. She's very thin. And she can just about eat whatever she wants to, and it doesn't, I don't know what happens to it. It just evaporates. Praise God. I eat it, and, and you can see it the next day. Praise God. It's just the way it is. But abstaining from these sinful desires is extremely important so that God can move and bless your life. Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee. That's the most difficult thing in the world to do. Why? It's because even if you want to, if you don't get a hold of that sinful nature, that carnal nature, and you put these desires to death, it's going to vex you. The problem in America is you're not going to hear this spoken too much. The churches are running wild, having parties and making gigantic organizations. And it's just like, you know, Hollywood all over again. They're getting what they want. And that's good if sanctification is still taking place in the life. Because I love music. I happen to like the lights. I happen to like all of that. I love the big umfa with the music. I love it. But if that's all we have, and there is no difference between us at the Grammy Awards and the Grammy Awards, then there's something wrong. Sinful desires that are not dealt with in your life will eventually continue to grow and grow, and the devil will sit back and wait until an opportune time, and you will move upon those. When you're on a, a mountaintop with God, you ever notice that when the Spirit of God is moving and you feel good, those sinful desires are way, way out of your mind? you know why? Your spirit is energizing your mind with thoughts of God so much that every one of your desires, and the, most of our desires are in our human body. We have a carnal nature. Sexual desires, desires for food, desires for this, desires for that is part of the human nature. We want control. Um, perfect example is people walking around that are not, they're atheists, but not only are they atheists, they have no moral system whatsoever. They're just acting like animals. Well, because they are an animal. They've been taught that 30 or 40 years in school. You evolve from animals. You're an animal. That's all. You're an animal. You're an animal. You're an animal. So therefore, when they do what animals do, all of a sudden they're wondering, well, why, am I, why is it a crime to do this? When all the other animals can do it, well, because we live in a civilized society. What is that? What separates us from the other animals is our spirit. 
That's why when you're in church, it's so important to come to church. Because you're worshiping God. You're praising God. You allow the Spirit of God to flood your heart. And your spirit joined to the Holy Spirit. You just say, wow, it's good to be here. It's like Peter and John on the, um, um, the Mount of Transfiguration where they saw Jesus transformed before them. Up until then, they only saw Jesus the carpenter's son. Joseph the carpenter's son. And uh, they didn't see him. But all of a sudden, he's transformed in his role of radiance and glory. He's talking to Moses and Elijah. And Peter goes, wow, this is really neat. Hey, it's a good thing. Hey, let's build a tent and stay here. And Jesus says, no, we got to go back down. They had a revelation of who he really was. My concern for you is you get that revelation sometime in your life. Where you get so... Such an image in your mind of the glory of God that that is what you'll chase after the rest of your life. Because everything else is idols. Pornography is nothing but idols. That's all it is. They're images that you put in your mind and they flood the area of your brain, the pleasure center of the brain, which is connected to sexual desire. And that's all this stuff does. It becomes an idol and a focus. That's all. Even when you try to get away from it. All you got to do is see it on the TV or flip through and you accidentally see it. And boom, the trigger goes off in your brain. Oh, what it would be if the one idol in your mind was the right idol and that is Jesus Christ. Where your mind was so stayed on him. That all of a sudden somebody starts saying just across the room, praise the Lord. And all of a sudden the glory of God's on you. Why? Because your heart is fixed upon him. That one thing that you desire it's not pornography. The one thing you desire is not drug addiction. It's not heroin. It's not cocaine. It's not going out and partying with your friends. That one thing is not just going out and eating a, a, a gluttonous meal, which all of us like to do once in a while. No, that's not the one thing. The one thing is that you might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of your life and behold the beauty of his temple, to see Jesus in the church, to see the glory of God upon people. To see how the Spirit of God is working inside of life to change them and transform them. To see how by the renewing of their minds that they can have their minds stayed upon Jesus more. You see, if Jesus is north, and by the way, the city of God's on the sides of the north. No matter where you go, you always understand where north is. You understand where Jesus is. And once you understand where north is, every other direction is very simple to find. But if you don't know where north is, and there's no sun out, and there's no moon out, and you're on the water, I can tell you right now, as someone who's been in the ocean, 100 miles offshore, when it is foggy out, and it is cloudy out, and there is no moon, even when you begin to look at the compass, you wonder whether or not that thing is going right. But the general rule that they teach you in uh, Coast Guard and Power Squadron things, trust your compass. I remember we were fishing out about 100 miles offshore and trying to get back to Jones Beach. You only have a certain amount of fuel. And we were out by the canyon, and then we're heading back. And I'm looking at that compass, and the winds were starting to blow. And I'm, I'm, we're in the boat, and we're going. And I'm getting a little nervous. I'm just there with my friend. I said, let's put on a life jacket. He goes, why? I said, just in case. And 100 miles out, you have no radio. And it's only good for 25 miles. And there were no cell phones back then. They're not good 100 miles out anyhow. So as far as I know, I could have been driving to China. Okay? I could have been going across to Europe. And, and I would have had no idea. And I started to panic because this, this, the compass is saying I'm going north. But for some reason, I'm driving for hours. I had to slow down. And I'm not seeing any of Jones Beach. So if you're hitting north, you have no problem because you're going to run into Long Island somewhere. But if you miss Long Island and you miss Montauk Point and you're off course, I could be traveling to Europe. And guess what? I would be in the shipping lanes automatically. And these massive tankers stop for no one. In fact, if they tried to stop, it takes about... 10 miles to stop these tankers because they're displacement hulls. So even if they try to stop, they don't stop. They need miles to be able to slow down their speed, these heavy oil tankers. So I was getting a little panicky. But then I remembered. My teacher told me when I took the power squadron course twice, 
Not because I failed it the first time. I wanted to take it again. Trust your compass. And I said, well, that's a dumb statement. Of course you're going to trust your compass. But when you are in the darkness, the only thing you can do is trust that compass. It's shaking back and forth, but it's pointing towards north. Finally, after about four and a half hours and running low on fuel, I saw, we call it the pencil as a boater. You call it the Jones Beach Tower. But when you're offshore about 10 miles, it looks like a little tiny pencil. And let me tell you, when I saw that, man, I was praising God. My friend was praising God because we knew that the compass was right. And everything that was telling us, turn around, this thing is wrong. Turn around, this thing is wrong. We trusted the compass. And my friends, this is what you do with the word of God. When everything seems to be going wrong in your life and nothing seems to be going right in your life, trust the compass. It's the word of God. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So what are you worried about? I don't, what am I going to do? Where am I going to live? How am I going to eat? Jesus said, you. Why? You know, all of you little faith. Your father feeds this. You know, not one sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. Or every hair on your head is numbered. And yet you worry so much about things that you have no control over anyhow other than trust that I will never leave you nor forsake you. How many people believe that even in the storms of your life that Jesus will never leave you? Raise your hand. That's what the Bible says. But I'll tell you, when I was, it was dark, there was no moon, no, no tricks, no nothing. There's, you know, with the moon, I can tell where I'm at. I can tell by the moon because I know what phase the moon is in, so I can kind of like know where it was when I, you know, I know where it's supposed to be in the sky. But when it's pitch dark and you can't see in front of you and it's foggy out, you trust the compass. That's what you do with your life. Why does God allow these things? Faith that is seen is not faith. I'll say it again. Faith that is seen. In other words, how can you tell me that you need faith to be able to uh, go out and, and start a brand new car that, you know, it start, it's, you know, it's just starting up? No, it's, it's going to start. You just have faith in these things. But suppose, suppose the car was broken down. And you said, I'm going to have faith to believe that God will at least start the car so I can get it home. That would be real faith. Well, God doesn't do those things. Why do you put limits on God? He said, if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. I can't begin to tell you how many times I have prayed over things that I broke or were broken or I was late or it was in a critical position where uh, I just did not want to be in that neighborhood because it's just not a good neighborhood and, and something would happen. I say, oh, God, please don't let me run out of gas. And then I'd get to a gas station and the car would stall right at the pump. And the gas station attendant, when we used to not have to pump, you know, uh, they used to um, always pump. They go, boy, you just made it. I said, well, God's on my side. I can't begin to tell you how many times God has increased fuel in my car. Well, not lately, but in the past, okay? He's certainly done it many, many times. He's done a lot of things, tremendous things. Why? I have the faith to believe. Jesus said, ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Why? Isn't it tested, though, when it's dark to believe that word? The only way that I have found that you can truly walk in the Spirit of God is to deal with this area of self-control. These sinful desires that wage war against your soul. You might not, be, well, I'm not into porn and I'm not killing anybody and I'm not stealing anything from anybody. But it's these little foxes that spoil the vine. Catch the little foxes that spoil the vine is the scripture. It's the little ones. The little foxes. Not the big foxes, these little ones, because they're only picking at the, they're picking at the things that's most, you know, Nobody really cares about it, kicking at the bottom of the vine. But what are these little foxes that mess up our Christian's life? I'll, t I'll name a couple. Maybe you can help me out here. Uh, criticism. Backbiting. Loving somebody when you're in front of them, saying nice things, and behind your back, 
when he's not around, you, you say things, or she's not around, you say things in a negative way. That's called backbiting. You're biting the person in the back when they can't see who you are, but you're saying it. But God hears it. That's a, that's, that's a little fox that spoils the vine. The devil uses these things to try to cause us to not sense the presence of God so we do not move in faith. You can't move in faith if you're moving in the flesh. You can't. A water fountain cannot give out clean water and dirty water at the same time. It's going to do one or the other. Or it'll be just a mere mixture. One or the other. The devil knows that. So he catches us with little foxes here. So criticism and backbiting. Can anyone think of anything else? Pride, sure. Pride comes before fall. But it's not, I have pride in Jesus. I have pride. I feel really great when somebody gets blessed. I'm not talking about that. We're talking about self-righteous pride. Like I did this and I did this. How can you tell when it's self-righteous pride? It's very easy. You do something for somebody and they don't thank you and you get ticked off. That's pride. You hurt your feelings. You feel as if you weren't appreciated. That's a normal reaction. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if it gets to the place where you break fellowship with that individual, then your reason for doing it was really nothing but a self-righteous thing, performance. You're living a performance-based life. When Jesus said, when you give, don't let your right hand know what the left is doing. In other words, when you give, give in secret. But if you give only to go ahead and get reaction from people to make you feel good, that's, that's pride. When you pray, the Pharisees loved to pray in public. And this is the way they used to do it. They'd have their robes, and they would walk, and then they would stop, and they would lift their hands, and they'd start praying. And everyone around them would stop and look at them and say, what a holy man. And Jesus is going around saying, you know, you love to pray, you hypocrites. You think God hears you because you're many words. He said, but when you pray, he said, what you do is you go into your secret place. Don't be like these Pharisees who love to be seen by others. But go into your secret place. Shut the door behind you and your father who sees in secret will outwardly reward you. Here's a scripture in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, that's the key. The battle is in your mind, isn't it? The devil does everything in his power to stop your mind from being renewed. Why? Because if your mind gets renewed, what a renewed mind does is it fixes upon Jesus and the Holy Spirit working within them. And then they begin to understand the scriptures and they can do battle against the devil, not only for their own lives, but the lives of others. You see, once you're saved, the devil realizes he can't unsave you. But he can trip you up, get you so that you're not effective, that you don't do anything other than maybe once, once in a while go to church or go to church on Sunday, but then live in the flesh the rest of the week so that you don't witness to nobody. The most dangerous individual to the devil is somebody who's living a sanctified life, who is, has a daily prayer life, who's praying, Father, not my will, but thine be done. Not my will, but thine be done. He's dangerous to the devil, and the devil concentrates all of his efforts to try to get that individual frustrated, depressed. He tries to mesh his feet. He tries to mess him up so that he can't open his mouth. But for the majority of Christians, they're only Christian in name only. There's not enough evidence during the week to convict them of Christianity by their actions. And God wants us to be a Christian, not just on Sunday, but 24 hours a day. Don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world. What, what, what do you mean the pattern of the world? What do you think he's talking about? The pattern of the world. For example, I was a musician. Every Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday night, those are the big nights in, in clubs and bars and whatever like that. So... I knew that those three nights were going to be the most crowded. And when you work in a union gig, you've got to work still six nights a week, and the rest of them, forget it, there's hardly anybody there. The pattern of the world. You go there, what do you do? You set up your equipment, have a few drinks at the bar, 
My job is to get everybody excited and drinking and everything else like that. So they sell liquor. That's what we do in clubs. And um, I worked in bars where they made a lot of money. I mean, they didn't let anybody in unless you were going to throw $300. You know, that's what the bar tab was going to be. And, of course, the guys would be willing to do that because there were beautiful girls there. So, therefore, all these businessmen and yuppies would want to come in and try to pick up these girls. And who are these girls? These girls were beautiful women that were probably newly divorced, or they were college students that were just looking for a sugar daddy. And everybody's just pairing up, and by the end of the night, who's ever left over? You know, the leftovers are the leftovers. You say, boy, that's really raw, Pastor. That's that world. That's that pattern. Well, I don't go there for that. Well, you might not go there for that. I'm going to tell you right now, there's a lot of people that are going there for that kind of stuff. But let's tell you, if you want a godly man, you ain't going to find him in a bar getting drunk. Okay? You're not going to find him on the street corner somewhere. But if you want a godly man or you want a godly woman, then you're going to find him probably in church. And still in church, you've got to be careful. You've got to check it out. But how do you check it out? It's very simple. Find out if they're living to the pattern of the world. Girls, I'm going to give you a heads up. Next time a guy wants to take you out, he says, listen, do you conform to the pattern of this world? Or are you conforming to the image of Jesus Christ? Right away, you'll be able to tell. If they go, huh? Absolutely. Bye. You're a loser in my eyes. Not going to spend the rest of my uh, year with you. Because marriage is a long haul and it's very, very difficult to live with somebody for the rest of your life. Why? Because most of you haven't lived the rest of your life yet. In fact, all of you haven't lived the rest of your life. So how can you really tell? The pattern of the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What a challenge. I'm going to leave you with these scriptures I found in Ephesians. And I want to read them. And I think they're self-explanatory, so I don't even have to speak anymore on this subject. But this is just practical advice from the Apostle Paul to the church at Ephesus. By the way, the church at Ephesus in the book of Revelation is the church that lost its first love. So therefore, the words that Paul spoke to Ephesus, Ephesus was doing a good job. How can I tell they were doing a good job? Because he wrote this to them, and he didn't have to, he didn't have to sugarcoat it. He didn't have to kind of like polish him up and, you know, and just I'll pat him on the back. Oh, you're doing fine. You're doing fine. You're doing fine. No, he could hit him with the raw truth of the word. And if you're a real Christian, what I do when I go to, a, 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 if I'm in another service, I say, Holy Spirit, hit me between the eyes. If I'm missing anything in my prayer life, if you want something to change me, hit me right between the eyes, Holy Ghost. Just hit me on there with a prophetic word. Here I lay my heart bare. Why? I want to hide your word in my heart that I not sin against you. I don't want to give in to my sinful desires anymore. I'm not perfect, but at least I'm working on it every single day. I'm saying, not my will, but thine be done. Not my will, but thine be done. Not my will, but thine be done. And then I work on trying to catch these little foxes that spoil the vine. Jess and I have been working on that. I don't want nothing negative coming out of my mouth. If I speak about you, I want to speak about the good things about your life. Because every one of you here has wonderful things in your life. But you also have things that are not so great in your life. Same with me. But if we fall into the trap of the devil and start criticizing each other and talking about the negatives of each other when they're not around, the devil loves that. It's a little fox. It spoils the vine. It quenches the spirit. And it's one of the biggest problems in the church in America today where the spirit of God isn't moving anymore. And there's a lot of people say, well, I don't believe in the spirit of God moving anymore in those gifts. How sad. <laughs> it's not by might. It's not by power. It's not by music. But by my spirit, says the Lord. I added the word music. I'm a musician. Music has a way to soothe the soul. Whether it's secular or spiritual music, that's the problem. Here we go. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 to 32. So I tell you this, and insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They're darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of the hearts. Your heart used to be hard. Think of it. Before Christ, your heart was hard. You weren't open to the gospel. Then you heard the gospel and you allowed the light to come in and God gave you a new heart so that you could understand them. 
but we still struggle. But he's talking to Christians here. And he says in verse 19, having lost all sensitivity, this is not only the Christians who are saved now in the past of the way they were, but the Gentiles in the world that don't know God. The same people that are some of our friends, some of our family members. They don't know God still. They've lost all sensitivity, gave themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity with a continual lust for more. If there was ever a description of Hollywood today, that is it. However, in verse 20, you did not come to know Christ this way, since surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life, let's read it together, to put off your old self. Do we have that up? Yeah. Which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. That's an interesting thing. You are to put off your old self, which was, no, is. Is being, is a state of being verb. It means present tense. If you don't deal with it, it's going to still corrupt. That's what the Bible's saying. It's kind of like uh, gardening. And I'm not a good gardener. You know, um, I love flowers, but I don't like weeding. You have to cultivate flowers. Isn't it amazing? But you don't have to cultivate weeds. They just grow. You can get the purest, the purest, the purest of soil. Even sanctified soil, they call it. No, it's, uh, kind of, you know, they took out all the, you know, it's kind of like irradiated soil. I can guarantee you the wind blows a little bit three weeks later. Boom, you're going to see things start to grow. Weeds just grow. And that's what sinful desires do. They still grow in our lives. You've got to deal with them every day. You've got to pull them out every day. Problem is, these are deeply ingrained habits, some of them. The images in our mind from the past, they come up, you've got to bring them to the cross. Take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Some of you out there are saying, ouch. I'm saying, ouch. But actually, you can't preach a message, really, that you're not living. Unless you borrow it and get it on Google. Or, you know, the million sermons that you can get and punch in, you know, sermons. And unfortunately, preachers, instead of getting from the Holy Ghost today, they're getting from Google, who seems to be, like, goggle now. Okay? It's like it's becoming the place where you get messages from some of the greatest writers in the world, and you take that sermon. Now, of course, if you can take an outline and the whole Lord will anoint it, but I'd rather go to Jesus and say, Jesus, you know the people that are coming to this church service Sunday morning. I don't even know who's going to show up, but you do know. So therefore, you know their needs. So Lord, you put it upon my heart what you would like me to speak about. Because if I speak to you and bless your brain, your spirit's not going to change. And the desires that are waging war against your soul will not be dealt with. And you're going to live another week in struggles that are unnecessary if you could respond to a word where grace would come to set you free and grant you the grace to really change. Verse 23, to be made new in the attitude of your minds. How many people would like to be really new today in the attitude of your minds? And put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each one of you put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Whew, I feel good about that. Sometimes I get a little angry. Okay, but it says, in your anger, do not sin. Another translation says, be angry and sin not. In other words, we Christians don't go around with just a big smile on our face even when we're hypocrites. No. The fact is we have emotions. Sometimes we get upset. Things upset us, but don't sin. Don't let it carry to the place where you end up saying things or doing things that you know you're going to regret the next day. Because emotions have no reason. You should write that down. Emotions are reasonless. Emotions have no north. It's like a, emotions are like a compass without the ability to point towards north. They have no way of finding north. Do not let the sun go down while you're angry and do not give the devil a foothold. 
Verse 28, he who has been stealing, steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands so that he might have something to share with those in need. And do not let unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it might benefit those who listen. Is that sound advice? How many people think that's pretty sound advice? I mean, it's the Bible. It's not something like I'm giving you the option of believing it or not believing it. Well, this is the word of God. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mind. How about listening to unwholesome talk in movies? That's what I'm dealing with now in my mind. By the way, I do watch movies. But I'm having a real difficult time watching the unwholesome talk coming out of their mouths because I'm watching it as entertainment. And, I, and, and I'm sitting there with the Holy Ghost, and I feel the, the Holy Spirit say, well, son, you want me with you all the time, and, you know, I'm not getting blessed by this. Do you like what's coming out of their mouths? And I'm going, well, it's just a movie, Lord. It's just a movie. Just a movie? I'm taking it in, these images into my mind. I told Jess the other day, I can't watch any of these science fiction movies before we go to sleep. I start dreaming about all of the characters in the science fiction movie. They're in my dreams. I said, I'm not watching that more. I gotta, I'm going back to the clip. So I, I took out that movie that I told you about last week, Stormy Weather. Great movie. Cab Calloway. It had Bill Williamson, who was the tap dancer that was teaching uh, Shirley Temple how to dance in all those movies. And it had uh, Fats Walla playing piano in it. It had Lena Horne in it. And it's a musical. It's a, a black musical, and it was written in the 30s. And, uh, and I watched that before I went to sleep, and it was amazing. Since there was no unwholesomeness going on in the whole thing, none whatsoever. Just dance and tap dancing. Guess what? Didn't affect my dreams at all. The Lord woke me up four in the morning. I was talking to Jesus. And I woke up in the morning and I felt the Holy Ghost say, Son, what'd you learn? The other night you watched this crazy science fiction movie with all this death and dying and, and all this garbage that goes on in these supernatural movies. And how'd you feel then? I said, I felt yucky. It took me an hour to get rid of that. Just images in my mind. He said, how'd you feel after, you know, like watching, you know, a musical from the 30s where there was no cursing, nothing was allowed to be, uh, you, know, you know, sinful or anything. I just, I just didn't affect my mind at all. And the Lord said, what'd you learn? I said, I learned I don't want these images in me. Now, maybe you're different than I am. But I'm on a quest now that God has restored my spirit, my soul, and my body. I'm on a quest now to please him. I'm on a quest to try to see if I can walk in the Spirit every day. Isn't that the quest of every Christian? So therefore, I want to be careful about the thoughts that I take into my mind. Do not let any, verse 29, unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it might benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to each other, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Wow. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know if you do this, but I say, Lord, am I grieving you in any way? That's a loaded question. Expect the Holy Ghost to answer. Okay. So I'm just trying to clean up my act. Well, I want to see the power of God move. But guess what? Not for me. I'm doing pretty good. I can pray. Or I have one of you guys pray. God heals me. I'm fine. But I want to see the power of God move for you. That God would heal you. That God would heal those in your family. Your children. You tell me your children are messed up either on drugs or just messed up. Or they need to get saved. Do you know what that sends me into? That sends me into overdrive. To want to go home and start praying. And saying, God, they're in the fight for their life. Their soul is in danger. I ask God that you would set them free in the name of Jesus Christ. That's what we do on Wednesday nights. We just don't sit around and talk about all the things that are wrong. No, we pray through and believe that God is going to answer these prayers. I want more power to move through my life. And I feel as if when I'm reading the scriptures, the Lord said, then sanctify me in your life more. Let me renew your mind. Win these battles, son, in your mind. Get them to the place where all of these images that you put in there from years ago, 
they become such distant memories that they can't even, they can't even explode in your vision and your imagination anymore. That it's much going to be easier for you, Lord, uh, for, for, for you, son, to put your eyes upon me. Fixing our eyes upon Jesus, the author and the finish of our faith. Fixing our eyes upon Jesus. Fixing our eyes upon Jesus. You can't do that if you're not even thinking about him except maybe one day a week. But we can do that if we just start by a simple prayer, say, Lord, ouch, today. Now, I don't know if this word ministered to, to you, but it certainly ministered to me, and it certainly ministers to anybody who really would want to be where the Apostle Paul said. And he finished up with this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come. I'm ready for some new things. It's a new year coming. If you do the same, if you live your life the same way you did in 2015 as you did in 2014 with not one change, but I can tell you right now, nothing is going to change. That's insanity. That's the definition of insanity. You heard it. Doing the same thing over and over and over and over, thinking the same way over and over and over, watching the same things over and over and over, and expecting change. That is insanity. But I'm going to forget what lies behind, and I'm going to reach forward to what lies ahead and press towards the mark of the high call in Christ Jesus. I want to see the power of God move not only through my life, but I want to see the power of God move through your lives in such a powerful way that you'll be writing me letters and saying, Pastor, it works. It works. Let's stand on our feet and go before the Lord in prayer. Say this with me. I'm a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. I will win the battle in my mind. God, grant me grace to abstain from sinful desires which are waging war against my soul. I don't want to conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but I want to be transformed by the renewing of my thinking. I give you permission, Holy Spirit, to lead me and guide me into all truth. You said I would know the truth, and it would set me free. I heard the truth today. Help me to put it into practice. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.